Every generation has its pop culture touchstones. These are things that they share in common despite differences in geography, ethnicity, race, politics, or income. They take the form of music, television shows, and films, and the artists that create them connect us all in a very special way. The same can be said of the photographers who make images of these artists. Some of these photographs help to make these artists iconic, while others reveal their humanity. The best of these photographers succeed in doing both. Greg Gorman is one such photographer. In his decades-long career, Greg has photographed legends, including Sophia Loren, Michael Jackson, Grace Jones, Michael Jordan, Elton John, Quincy Jones, and thousands more. His images possess a signature visual quality, but also reflect that special connection between a photographer and his subject. I recently sat down with Greg to discuss his new book, It's Not About Me, A Retrospective. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. First off, congratulations on the book. Well, thanks. That's it's, exciting. It's kind been of a long time coming. I wish we could be doing a little bit more for it, but uh, I did a lot of press in Europe, and I had hired a publicist over there. I am actually may start working with the gentleman here to do a little bit, but uh, it's tough. And uh, the day of COVID, no gallery shows, no book signings, so it's word of mouth, and so being able to do this with you is, is a, a blessing. Thank you for having me on. Well, I'm a big fan, and uh, anything I can do to help spread the word is uh, is, is the least that I can do. Well, thank uh, you. I, I really appreciated the preview you gave us. Was it earlier in the year, was it? God, yeah, when was it? It was with George. Oh my God. Yeah, it was George's birthday, so. Uh, right, right. Yeah. There's so much that I could talk to you to you about, but I've been thinking a lot about people who kind of do the work that you do, you know, portrait photographers. And one of the things people all often focus on is like the technique, how, how you know, how they light and all those technical things. But the, the more I've gotten to know you, I've been really fascinated how you approach people and how you work with them. Because one of the things that I've really have appreciated spending personal time with you is how engaging of a host you are. And I'm definitely a people person. I think I you know, found my calling when I decided to uh, photograph people, for sure. Yeah, and I think that that is, that is one of your inherent strengths as a photographer. Yeah, you do wonderful things with light. You, you, can, you, know, you can work a lens as good as anybody. But that sort of that ability to be able to sort of create a safe space for someone, especially people who are celebrities, who are all often subject to uh, the attention of a lens, I think is something that's underrated by, by too many people who aspire to do the kind of work that you do. I think you hit on a big thing, and I haven't heard too many people say that, but it's interesting that you said that because I think that plays a, a key factor and has played a key factor in my career in terms of dealing with high-profile celebrities that necessarily aren't necessarily always comfortable in front of a camera but in front of my lens they feel they have a little bit of a safety fact they know i've kind of covered their butts and look after them more than i do the editorial people or the even the movie people i kind of hold the personality talent first and foremost in my uh on the good side of the fence to make sure that they're safe before anybody else i guess so is that sort of a a natural quality or is that something that was nurtured? No, I always felt that it was, you know, the time invested in taking a portrait was not just a one-way street, but a two-way street. And I felt that uh, I wanted to make sure that the people on the other side of the lens from me were comfortable and had a level of confidence and had a sense of security. Because I think a lot of times, you know, when they're playing a character other than themselves, they're more nervous in front of a still camera than when they're right. hiding behind a movie character. So. I think if I can assure them that, you know, their ass is covered and that their pictures are going to be retouched and that they can see what I'm doing, they feel more comfortable for sure. In your early work, you know, you, the experience that you created it was likely very different from what you create now. Uh, what, were, what were some of the essential things that you felt were really critical that you learned early on to allow you to be able to create this environment? 
And if you can give us an example of a shoot, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a lot of it had to, had to do with making sure that the talent had, that I met all their needs and their requirements. I remember one of my very first shoots in my little canyon apartment. I borrowed a friend of mine's Hasselblad to shoot an album cover for Leon and Mary Russell for the wedding album. Le and I had the Hasselblad there, and Le Leon looks up and he says, well, where's your Polaroid? I said, well, why would I use a Polaroid? I'm shooting with a Hasselblad. I didn't even know what a Polaroid back was in those days, if you can imagine that. So that, of course, it immediately went on my list of things I better get and make sure I have. But I think, you know, working in an environment where I work with hair and makeup people that understand my vision, stylists that understand what I'm looking for, a good studio manager, assistants that can uh, uh, anticipate my next move, a chef, full-time chef that always did cook all my meals for yeah. me back in the day, not anymore. But, uh, you know, I, had, I put together a team that I think really helped support me. And I think, you know, from taking pictures, of course, we shoot so differently that a support team is so critical in terms of keeping my image up there and keeping the ball rolling, so to speak. So I've, I've worked, I've been blessed. I've had like the same camera assistants for 25 years and, and so on and so forth. You know, your work is so distinctive in terms of the, the look but you still have to get the sort of the buy-in of the people that are coming to you. Granted that after a certain period of time, you were known for, you know, a certain quality of image, but sort of early on, you know, you may have been a lesser known quality. So when you started getting like celebrity clients, you know, they're going to be like, well, who is this guy? Can I trust him? How is he going to make me look? Talk to me about sort of how you would educate the people that you were going to photograph in terms of not just the image, the individual image that you were going to create, but they could have confidence in what you were doing and how you were going to do it. Um, but I think you know, it's pretty much what I was saying. You really have to involve them in the decision-making process. I remember one day very early on in my career, I really hadn't uh, done a whole lot at this point, but I was working on a little picture for Universal and the lead actress was replaced by Barbara Streisand of all people, but her, her uh, agent's husband was directing the movie, and so Barbara took over the role. And one day, I'm sitting in my little one-bedroom apartment in Little Canyon, and my phone rings, and it's, uh, man, I speak to Greg Garman. This is Barbara Streisand. And I thought this is a <laughs> joke. You know, I didn't even think it was real. And it was Barbara. Because I understand you're the special photographer on the movie I'm starring in. And I said, uh, yes. And she says, uh, so how are you planning on shooting me? I said, well, what colors do you like, Barbara? And then she went on from there. I like popsicle color, pinks and lavenders. So, you know, it's working with them, throwing stuff back in their court, doing mm. a homework. I never like to look at pictures of someone I'm going to photograph before I shoot them. Um, I like to come into that very cold. I don't want to look at other people's work. But I spend as much time with the talent in the makeup room prior to a shoot, getting to know them to kind of come up or down to their level to kind of win their trust and confidence. I think, you know, if you don't win a talent's trust and confidence, you're not going to get to first base with them. So it really starts there. It starts with making them realize you're playing for their team and that uh, it's a joint effort. You know, I think it's like shedding your clothes in front of a lens. I mean, people are nervous and they're vulnerable. So the more factors that you can eliminate that make them more comfortable is going to give you a better chance of getting a connected portrait through the lens. This book, it looks amazing. And as much as it is, a sort of great collection of, of the body of work that you've created over these many years. I also assume that you look at it as a sort of diary of your life. It yeah. is. Uh, it's funny because, you know, I went through, um, I went through 160 boxes editing this book and it was a real difficult decision choosing who was, who would be in and who would be out. Unfortunately, I really had to kind of just go with, uh, I'm just going to keep it towards the heavy hitters for this book because, you know, I've done so many of my fine art books that are my male and female nudes and the eye works and the street photography and all this stuff. I wanted this book mm -hmm. to just be reminiscent of the kind of the stronger portraits that I've done. You know, a lot of them, I think, is you know, we talked about the last time you and I spoke, are pretty commercial in this book compared to a lot of my work. But I think it also is part of the evolution of a photographer as you see your style change as you start to find your voice, find your look. And, you know, that, that came along after a lot of overly lit, over-the-camera lighting situations with a lot of the portraits I created in the early days. So when you look at the, the book and you see those different pivotal points in terms of how you saw and how you photographed, you can sort of identify when things changed? 
you know, when I had read too much hair light and the picture was lit like an interchangeable postage stamp. So <laughs> I think I was around the time of Tom Waits at the end of the 70s when I started kind of taking the light off the center focal point of the camera. And also when I started working for Interview Magazine. My very first assistant actually taught me a lot, David Jacobson, who loved lighting with spot grids and really kind of taught me the ropes in the early days. And then I kind of just kind of enhanced it into my style, personal style. That thing of learning from the people who are assisting you, was that a part of your, your, your learning process as much as you just making your own images? Because some of these, some of these quote unquote kids that would come on board might have very different experiences or might have even a formal education in some of the things that you, you didn't necessarily have. Well, I never worked with an assistant all my, uh, all my life. I always shot alone. I never even realized you had an assistant. I didn't realize you worked with her and makeup people. I thought celebrities wore their own clothes. I mean, you know, it was quite an awakening when it all started coming together. And, uh, I would get a call, or who do you want to use for a stylist? It would be like, oh, and you know, what are your thoughts on hair and makeup? It's like, oh. So, you know, <laughs> everything kind of all that I remember the early, early, early photo sessions I did for a theater arts magazine called After Dark that was out of New York. And uh, it was kind of a pseudo gay theater arts magazine, but very upscale. And I would shoot portraits for people like Tony Perkins, Susan Terrell. I remember one of the first portraits I did was with uh, Michelle Phillips from the Mamas and Papas, mm -hmm. Tom Scarrett, Dennis Christopher, and they were portraits. And so, you know, I was shooting my little single apartment. I was shooting in the hall of my little one-bedroom apartment, Little Canaan. I'd have to stand out in the hall to be able to do a three-quarter length shot. So it was kind of funny, and I'd have the makeup artist set up there on the little coffee table in my living room. It was, it was you know, all a work in progress, I should say. That was back in the mid-'70s. Well, one of your uh, good friends and who you photographed multiple times has been Elton John, who uh, great, writes the introduction in your book. Yes. And uh, tell me about the first time you photographed him. Well, I just spoke to Elton a little while ago today. He just got his, I sent him a limited edition copy. He's over in London right now. We just spoke earlier today. Uh, gosh, I shot him, I guess, back probably early 80s, really early 80s, probably 80. To 84. We've known each other, I guess it's got, it's got to be close to 40 years. So I've seen Elton through a lot of changes and a lot of different, uh, different uh, iterations. I can honestly say he's one of the most down to earth, most amazing people I know with a compassionate heart. You know, I've been on his board of advisors for his AIDS foundation for the, for the run. And uh, he's, he's an amazing guy and a great family man. He's got two great kids. I went over and stayed with him, I guess it was the summer before last. Now it's been such a long time. And just was amazed at uh, what a great father, father he and David are, the two guys to the to their two boys. Pretty awesome. So what was the first shoot that you did? What was the... Uh, God, I don't um, know. For him, I, for, it was in the early 80s. I mean, I shot some album covers for him back in the day, back in the early days. The first time I think I saw him was around 1970 when he actually came to the 70 or 72. Then he first appeared at the Troubadour. I went to see a concert there with him. But I met him socially, and then we started working together in the early 80s, so. I couldn't tell you what the name of the early albums were. There, there are a lot of photographers that will work with a single subject for a long period of time. And you've certainly done that with, with, with Elton. And beyond him just being a celebrity, just being as a friend and in a, in a repeated portrait subject, talk about the dynamic that that long-term relationship brings to your collaboration when it comes to photography. Well, I think that's a, a, a really good point and something to touch base on. A lot of the people that I had as clients, Bowie and God, Elton, certainly uh, Grace Jones. I mean, what it does, it's, it, there's a reassurance factor with people like that because we've built a relationship that's not only been built on trust and confidence, but the artists know that I know how to photograph them because I know mm -hmm. their strong points, their weak points, which angles work, which angles I'm not going to ask Elton to do because... If I did, he'd look at me like, you know damn well that I can't, you can't shoot me from that angle. Same with like Beth Miller I worked with for 40 years. So going into a shoot with people that you've had these, you've built these relationships with, you already start at a much higher level when you begin the shoot because basically you know the person, you understand the person, there's a certain level of trust and confidence that goes without saying so that the person doesn't have to try to explain, well, you know, I want to shoot late afternoon light, Greg, can you please mm -hmm. shoot me uh, with a long lens? Um, I prefer my left side. You know, don't shoot up on me. You know, all of these are things that when we ultimately begin a shoot, we know 
pretty much uh, where we got to go and where we got to, where the beginning is and where we need to end up. And oftentimes when talent have to work with a new photographer, you know, it's uncomfortable not only for the photographer, but for the talent because the photographer doesn't know the person. So they're nervous if it's a big star and the talent is nervous because they don't want to end up with a lousy picture or maybe they're, you know, some of them are going to be brusque and difficult because some talent, oh, some of the talent is difficult or it can be difficult. But at the same point, other ones don't want to be you know, insulting or nervous or uptight around a young photographer that maybe doesn't know the ropes of the, of the game at this point. So building relationships that last certainly make it easier basically for the talent and for the, uh, for the photographer to basically come to grips with getting a, a connected, strong portrait in much less time, I should say. And that's, that's often the key factor, how much time they want to put into it. Did you find it as you started, as you, you know, started getting a real sense of, I don't want to say control, but a real sense of yourself as a ph photographer in terms of how you liked to work, that you found yourself wanting to make things simpler? Well, certainly uh, with the onset of digital, things got much simpler, uh, much less complicated. You had to use much less light, uh, much less gear. But I mean, I'll tell you, even the last couple of times that I shot uh, digital, like when I worked with Elton, when we went to do uh, the pictures for Elton, it's a good example since you brought him up for his world tour. I went to Vegas to do all the pictures for the, you know, for the tour book. My God, we had a truckload of gear and a soundstage and we had to build a... Uh, a trailer that was like a little apartment for him, dressed out with candles and flowers and everything so he was comfortable, a ramp for him to go up that was easier for him to access the trailer. We had to make sure we had all the proper catering. And I had to have six backdrops set up, six sets built. Jesus. So that could virtually walk from one to the next and there was no downtime in between because of scheduling and how much time he had to shoot because he was finishing his Vegas shows and I had a window of about two hours to do a tour program, tour book. So I basically had to have six sets. Let's say you talk about equipment. I mean, it wouldn't, I wouldn't say that was simple. We had, you know, all kinds of lighting gear, backdrops, stands, electronics. You can imagine specific music for the shoot, you know, stylus with all the wardrobe, the hair and makeup. It was, you know, still, still could be a big deal, you know. And what was the turnaround for you in terms of getting getting all those images out to them? Pretty quick. Um, I guess we had, you know, the problem was they all had to be heavily retouched and mm -hmm. organized. I think. I think we had, you know, and then I had to run them, show them to David and Elton to get the sign-offs from Rocket Entertainment and all. I guess it was uh, a few weeks. But this it really was probably less than that because actually I took the pictures, I want to say, I want to say I took, I want to say I took them in May of uh, 15 or 16 right before the tour started. And uh, we had to turn around in a few weeks because they had to get the tour book done. They were getting ready to go right out on the road in just a few weeks. He virtually finished his, uh, his obligations in Las Vegas at Caesars. And then it was the time to turn around and get out on the road for three years, which of course, you know, was broken up because of COVID. Elton's very photo literate. He has a huge collection of, of, of photography. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, people have a varying degrees of understanding of photography. Did you find that that the more literate they were about photography, the more the, the more difficult or easier it may have been to photograph them? Well, no, I mean, you know, you can read what Alton wrote in my book, which he probably did. I mean, he hates being photographed. He uh, finds it hard dealing with himself and looking at images of himself. So we've shot for so many years and he trusts me. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't say that his... And he's one of the most knowledgeable people in the entertainment business that I know of in any business about photography. He's a master collector of <clears throat> master art, all original early vintage prints and things. Uh, he doesn't really bring that to the table when we're shooting, you know, commercial stuff for his portrait. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I really had to go through to I have a million portraits of him, but, you know, a lot of them are fairly brightly lit and pretty poppy because that's kind of Elton and that's kind of the look. You know, they're not my typical dramatic portrait, so to speak. He was funny when we spoke today because he said that when he was looking through the pictures and he, he there's a portrait of him in the book with the two children with his two sons. And he said, you know, he was showing them much older now. So he was showing them the picture and they said they were like smiling and, you know, amused by seeing them as little kids, as babies. Yeah. You know, um, Cynthia, 
was we I mean I mean she and I were talking to each other and she she uh, showed me the picture of your mother you know who I know oh, was an important part of your life and she said yeah. you just look at her and says you just look at that woman and you know she didn't take any s no, <laughs> no. My, mom, my mom was so awesome yeah we were so incredibly close you know it's one of the greatest loss of my life ever obviously and uh, you know you lose a parent and you know I was close to my mom I moved her out here from Kansas City and which is where I grew up and I took care of her, you know, and she worked up until pretty much the end. And, you know, I got her a beautiful apartment really close to me and I see her pretty often, but when you lose your parent, you always realize there's so much you never ask them and you didn't know. And I think that's yeah. one of my biggest regrets, but my mom was fabulous. Yeah. She was funny. It's a total character. And, you know, she, she raised you, your two brothers, you know, yeah. pretty much on herself. And she so, raised us on her own. Absolutely. Yeah. So my so, dad not part of the picture. Yeah. So, you know, witnessing how hard your mom worked, as much as your skills as a photographer and your, your per, you know, your personal ability and all that, I, I'm sure that your mother gifted you with certain qualities that made what you do possible. What, what would you say some of those are? Well, I think sense of humor, wicked sense of humor, her candor, her frankness, her total honesty, which I think is a big part of what I have to deal with when I'm shooting. I mean, I'm very direct with the celebrities. I mean... I think in the earlier days, I was a little more reserved. But, you know, I remember, you know, working like even with Bette Midler, and I did always would do this thing where I would bring her shoulder up and kind of shoot over the shoulder. And she mm-hmm. said, bring your shoulder around. And she said, why should I bring my shoulder around? I said, so you've got a fucking chicken neck. And she goes, what's wrong with my chicken neck? And <laughs> you know, so we would go on and on. But, you know, when celebrities, and I mean, I did the same thing with Burt Reynolds and his bad toupees and that, you know, his heavy-duty makeup that was just always so heavy. I'd say, Bert, that's, you know, that's, you know, people, you know, the, their own personal assistants were afraid of their own shadow for their jobs. It's pretty much like the jerk offs in office, all the fucking Republicans that just kissed Trump's ass and you know, they hate him. It's the same thing with the celebrities. So many celebrities have surround themselves with yes people. You know, they're all mm-hmm. right there to tell the celebrity how fabulous they look and how everything's perfect when it's not, but it helps build their confidence and their trust and, you know, sometimes I'd have to say, you know, hey, you know, your mop isn't screwed on straight. You got enough makeup on. You look like a claymation, Bert. And, and things like that. You just sometimes, you know, it ta- it took being honest sometimes with these people to get them to realize, hey, you know, I, you are playing for my team. You are looking at You do have my back. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the stuff I learned from my mom a lot, you know, just brutal honesty, wicked sense of humor. She just was an amazing person. Yeah. How was she as a subject? Oh, she hated to have her picture taken. You know? <laughs> well, I guess you saw the picture of her up in my bedroom, huh? On the on the uh, yeah. dresser. Mm-hmm. Now, did you see any of the old ones? She modeled for a little while, and she actually was a model. And then she grew up with Jean Harlow. She was friends with Jean Harlow because she was. Oh, was she? Yeah, I think they went to school together. So it's pretty wild. But my mom was quite a beauty when she was younger. Yeah, she was pretty amazing. When you were uh, going through this, through your, through those boxes of images. What were the surprises you found? I found a lot of people that I didn't realize I'd photographed, which was pretty wild. I'm, wow, I didn't know I shot them. And you know, I'd pull out this envelope and I wouldn't realize that, wow, I photographed that person. You know, I shot that, I can't remember her name, the lawyer for the Menendez boys. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And I didn't realize I'd shot her. And I had this picture that's in the book, actually, of uh, Gerard Butler. And I pull out this envelope, this skinny, cute boy. And the envelope says Jerry Butler on it. It was, you know, Jerome Butler before he became that uh, big macho. I doubt he even knows he's in the book. And there's a picture also of, of uh, there's a lot, few pictures in there that were kind of surprises, but there were a lot of pictures I found that I didn't have any recollection of having shot, which is pretty crazy. In the day, I was shooting, you know, six, seven shoots a week minimum, sometimes two or three a day, and back and forth to New York and, and back and forth a couple times a week to Europe, sometimes twice in one week. It was Crazy period back in the 80s and 90s. So are most of the images in the book commissioned work? Uh, ca- most of the images in the book came from commissioned work. Yeah, most of them were not like personal shoots. A few, a handful of them were, but most of them were all commissioned work. And sometimes it would be, as I wrote in there, sometimes it was a moment in between when I went back and revisited some of the work that was more interesting than the uh, more staid, mm-hmm. straightforward, still life, so to speak, that I shot. Tell me about one of the ones just like that, that may have not been a used, may used originally because it just didn't fit, you know, the, maybe the, the editor's taste in terms of what they wanted. But which when you saw it, a picture of Tim Curry, where his head's down and you don't see his face, it's just the yeah. top of the hat 
or the one where Sonia Braga right across from Tim has got her hand covering her face. Um, you know, there were lots of moments. Even the Siegfried and Roy pictures of pulling up the sweater and wearing the bandana over or the blind over Siegfried's eyes. They probably never used those pictures, but I found them to be more telling portraits. I found oftentimes the moments in between were more telling portraits than what I planned to shoot. A perfect example, a couple perfect examples would be, and it's been one of my most successful images, was the picture of Christopher Walken who got up from the chair where I was shooting him yeah. his head right up against the wall and boom, and nailed the picture. Sometimes it's those, it's one of the things that I learned, I am such a control freak and it's one of the reasons I went back to doing stills over being a, working in the movie business, even though that my degrees in film from USC is that I am a control freak and I like to have everything planned out and I like to know what I'm doing every step of the way. And uh, one of the things I did learn early on was the importance of being open and ready for that spontaneous moment. Mm -hmm. Kind of like your show a little bit, how you, you know, you kind of sometimes will pick up and just sometimes you'll move off onto one other thing. I know when I've listened to some of your podcasts, um, you know, you'll be on one tangent, but then something will trigger you and you immediately will drift into something that make you know, that is uh, more important than what you were maybe going to ask. Yeah. And that's a key uh, quality of a good interviewer is being able to be spontaneous and to, and to shift gears when something comes up that's maybe more interesting than what you planned. Over the past several months, I've noticed an increase in emails from people interested in either appearing as guests on the show or as advertisers interested in sponsoring an episode. I consider everyone that comes my way. However, there are a certain number of these people that I seriously doubt have ever listened to the show. They make pitches that make it clear to me that they don't understand what the show is at its heart. Being exposed to our audience is what's important to them, which I can't blame them for. But if it doesn't feel right to me, I don't make the choice to do it. That may not make the best business sense if monetizing the podcast was my bottom line, but it isn't. I want every minute of the show to be what I want it to be. I want it to serve you in the best way possible. There are some guests and advertisers I will eventually say yes to, but it's because I feel it's best for me, for you, and the show. Until then, I'm reliant on your financial support for the work that we do. It's hard work and it takes a lot of time, but each episode is worth all that effort. And if you believe in it, even a fraction as much as I do, why don't you join us and become a Patreon supporter today? You can do that by contributing $5, $10, $20 or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. Even $5 a month makes a difference. Of the thousands of people who download an episode each week, only a few hundred support the show financially. You can make a big difference for us by finally becoming a Patreon supporter today. Thank you, as always, for your support. Because one of the things I really appreciate your work is what I'll describe as a street photographer sensibility. You know, it's it's being able to recognize that spontaneous moment when it happens or right before it happens so that you can make the, the photograph. Because a lot of people can make nice pictures of attractive people. That's That's easy. But to make an engaging portrait of someone is altogether different. And like your your image of Sonia Braga is one of my favorite shots of yours. And it's just, there's nothing really dramatic happening, but there is a moment there. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a moment in time, you know. Yeah. yeah, and that's a skill that has to be developed, but it's, I, I find it, it's, it, I can't really say it's a skill that anyone can teach someone. So how do you feel like you refine that in yourself? so that when those moments presented your, itself, you were able to recognize it. Well, you know, a lot of times I miss those moments, and I, I know from listening to your talk for George, it's been the same for you. You caught him sometimes, and sometimes you have. Sometimes, like you were saying, you oftentimes uh, would go to a location, and you'd see your shot, but nothing was happening, and you would wait for something to walk into your frame. I mean, that's what you, I remember that one mm -hmm, shot. Yeah. 
and to get your picture. And it's the same for me. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've shot my ass off. And then as I put the camera down or drop the camera from my eyes, that celebrity, boom, hit. I went, damn, there was the shot. So sometimes it's, you know, holding on to that extra beat. And sometimes it's just a moment in between and I'll just grab it and shoot quickly. But, you know, I, most of my, most of the stuff in that book was all medium format. Most of that stuff was Hasselblad or Fuji. Oh, yeah. Or yeah. It's funny, I've gone back to now shooting Fuji and I, I finished out my film career shooting with the Fuji 6.8. Six, six, now I'm shooting with that Fuji, uh, that uh, GFX 100, which I just really, I love. How is that creating a different experience for you as opposed to what you were doing before? It's given me a, a, a little pickup. I mean, that camera with the 250 millimeter lens that I can come in really close and with my the big Titan lights from Rotolite, I mean, I, I'm just getting back into doing stuff I used to do 20 years ago. For a long time, I just kind of, as you know, kind of put the camera down and basically most of the pictures I was taking, with the exception of my occasional celebrity shoots, which I do, but I don't do much commercial work anymore, just occasionally. Was t most of my pictures were being taken when I was teaching, you know, during mm -hmm. my workshop. That's where most of my current photography has come from. It's not from too much from uh, commission work because I don't do much commission work. Um, I do more of my fine artwork and personal projects. So this camera has given me kind of a lift. I've got a new project I'm just getting started on with it, which I don't really want to talk too much about, but I will say it's shooting inanimate objects, and I've never shot still lights in my life. I will say that much about it. So this is sort of giving myself a self-imposed assignment, something new. It was like when I first started doing my male and female nudes, you know, pulling the camera back, stripping people of their clothes, but maintaining that still signature style of my relationship between my highlights and my shadows that uh, yeah. became inherently recognizable in my portraiture. Without going, going, you know, going into what you're photographing now, tell me about what the experience is like. What does it feel like when you're making these photographs as opposed to what you were doing for so long in your, in your career? Well, the subjects are not moving. <laughs> and uh, it's allowing me to look pretty much like what I did before, looking at angles. Um, the colors don't vary as much as they do with people. The wardrobe definitely doesn't vary. So consequently, it's definitely more challenging, and it's also working on a smaller scale. So you can imagine it's, uh, but still maintaining what I do. What's interesting about this project I'm working on is it's being done in collaboration with my dear friend Gary Johns, who was a creative director on my last book, on a few of my books. You might have met him, I'm pretty sure. He did my LA Iwerks campaign with me and a lot of my personal books he's been the art director on. So he's actually going to work on these pictures in addition to... Uh, my photography, so it's going to be a collaboration of art and photography. It's going to be a pretty cool project. I'm pretty super excited about it, and actually, I've been remodeling the house. I've been kind of, it's on the back burner, but it's going to start up in about the next two weeks, big time. Uh, Justin has been great with the gear from from uh, Fuji to play with, so I've been really happy. Yeah, I, I asked that because you know when you're first making photographs, there's a certain excitement and a fun about it, and I think inherent in that joy is the fact that you're learning so much and there are things that you don't know how to do, but you get excited about discovering. Like I said, because you hadn't been photographing commercially, you were primarily doing what you were teaching, which is a completely different dynamic than when you're just like doing your own thing. Absolutely. You think that this is allowing you to sort of rediscover that sense of discovery and joy? 100%. This is a project that has absolutely nothing to do with anything I've ever done before other than me bringing my background as a photographer and how I light and how I approach shooting subjects to this project. So yes, I'm very excited about this and putting together all the elements to make this happen has been, you know, a great joy. I've got the elements pretty much all together now. So I've got all the pieces of the puzzle um, down to, I even have a lazy Susan that I can put my subjects in and rotate to get the lighting right where I want it. So it's a, it's a bit, I mean, you know, it's pretty cool. You'll definitely love it. And when you come over, I'll explain more, but not on, uh, yeah. not for this. But it's it's going to be cool. And yes, I am very excited about it. And it is a project that I feel it will revigorate my uh, passion for taking pictures again. One of the things that I... I've uh, gotten a taste of is the full Greg Gorman experience. I mean, I haven't been at a shoot. You know, I've been at, I've been blessed to have dinner at your house, and I know that dinner and drinking wine and socializing is was often a big part of your 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 shoots. 
And that dynamic of just not just making the pictures and going by was never something you were inclined to, to do. And I suspect that that's why you've been able to not only enjoy the trust of so many people that you photograph, but also build long-term relationships. Talk about why that those moments, those personal moments when you guys aren't quote unquote working have been so important to you. Yeah, that wasn't all the time. I mean, you know, it's just like in anybody's business, you know, you click with some people and other people you don't necessarily click with. I mean, I, I'm a very gregarious person and I love people. So I click definitely, I can find good in more people than a lot of people can, you know, so I can <laughs> find good side of people. So we say, well, that person's an asshole. I go, well, I didn't think they were really an asshole. I thought they were kind of funny. But I always would gauge people a lot by my crew because, you know, celebrities would come in and because it was Greg Gorman, they're very nice to me, but sometimes they were an asshole to like, let's say one of my assistants or somebody in the hair and makeup or someone in the kitchen. And, you know, the people that treat everybody, because, you know, you're no better than the lowest person on the totem pole working for you, including the person that's parking the cars in your mm -hmm. parking lot. And I had my own, we had my own valet parking guy for my cars as well during the heyday and uh so consequently you know you recognize and the talent pretty much will dictate how they treat other people and then you can you get the feedback you know so and so i said hi to them and they just kind of dismissed me and you learn which ones are okay and which ones aren't and i mean there are plenty that i didn't waste time breaking bread with after the yeah. meal we always would have lunch generally before a shoot we almost always had you know films of especially if i was shooting a female where the makeup and hair took a couple few hours. Um, we usually get everything made up in the morning, have a lunch, and then shoot in the afternoon. And not too much wine until the end of the day. We don't poop people out during the shoot. But, you know, occasionally it was, there was a bottle or two crap. I have to ask because she's one of my favorite celebrity crushes, which is Raquel Walsh. I love Raquel. I have a lot of great, great fighting stories. Yeah, you photographed her so many times. Yeah, I photographed so many times. On her 80th birthday, you know, she just had a big birthday. Oh, yeah. I haven't, seen, I haven't seen Raquel for a couple few years, but I had a lot of fun with her, and we had a lot of crazy times yelling at each other. I mean, there were times when <laughs> she'd come over and she'd bring all her own food in these little containers, and it'd be like almost noontime, and she was still there. So she, she was a while in hair and makeup. And, uh, I mean, the results were always remarkable, and she's a beautiful woman. And, and she's a fun person. But, uh, you know, she'd be sitting there munching on her food, and I'd say, uh, Raquel, we're going to take a lunch break. Well, I'm not hungry. I said, well, you know, my crew's got to eat. Well, I've eaten. I said, well, you know, the fucking world doesn't revolve around Raquel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, well. <laughs> you know, but she was fun, and we did a lot of shoots together and uh, uh, worked together for many, many years. And, I mean, when you were – I mean, part of how I was able to get a lot of the big talent was one of your early questions that I – I don't know if I fully answered. I mentioned the bit about Barbara Streisand, but you know, it really, it's one. It's a two-way street. It's like uh, it's a catch-22 situation. Until you have these big stars in your stables, you know, you're not going to get the other one. So you know, they, you know, they're going to ask you. So who have you photographed? You know, you don't have a Barbara Streisand or a Bette Midler or a David Bowie in your portfolio. You know, they're maybe more insecure. It doesn't mean you're any less of a photographer, but it's building that level and benchmark of credibility. I was very lucky because early on. You know, I did the advertising art for pictures like Tootsie, Big Chill, Scarface, yeah. Pirates of the Caribbean. And it was basically the relationships I built with the big stars that had the studios hiring me to come back and shoot because they knew if I would go in with a De Niro or a Pacino, I'd get the pictures or Brando, I'd get the pictures. And, that, and you know, that was a big thing because in the early days when they would send a photographer in as a special, in other words, the unit photographers shot all the day, daily action on the set, but then... You'd come in and, you know, with the backdrops and the lights or whatever, and you would shoot the advertising out the one sheets. So, you know, you had a one shot deal at it and you didn't have a good relationship with the talent or a report. You know, you they're paying you all this money to get there. You don't get the shot. You get your money, but they don't get the pictures. So, you know, those relationships were very, very important to build with the talent. Yeah, the, the book is considerable. I look at it and it's really dawning to think about not only making the choices for all the pictures, but deciding which pictures play off of the other. And I know that that was a big consideration for you. Talk, talk to us about that. Director, yeah. Yeah. Tell us about that. That, that yeah, work he, with him. Well, he did most of the pairings, which are, you know, pretty funny. There's some great ones in the book. Down to one, the total kitsch one, which you must have gotten a good laugh out of, which is Barry White and Betty White. 
was a really good one. I don't know if you thought about it at the time, but that was a kind of a, wow, that's a pretty funny one. But I think a lot of the pairings played really well off each other. I mean, I did some of them, obviously. I worked with him on them, but that was Gary's kind of tour de force. And I think when you have a book of this size, you've got to have a little sense of humor and you've got to have something that keeps your eye moving. I mean, you know, I basically shoot big headshots and that's pretty much what the book is. It's a lot of big, mm -hmm. bold headshots. And so not to get, you know, burned out after looking at 350 photographs, the pacing and the uh, presentation's key. And I think Gary did an awesome job with that, really awesome job. And that, that's, a, that's a really good point about the headshot, because I think that that is probably one of the more difficult photographs to pull off and to make a distinctive image of someone, because you don't have the latitude of like hand gestures or body language. You're just dealing with the, the face. And, and you're up close and personal, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, if, if you're not careful, all your headshots can look exactly the same. So how, what do you think is your skill in being able to elicit such distinctive portraits of people when you're just using, just using their face? Well, I think a lot of it is how you go about lighting and body language, gesture, shape, form, balance. All of those things kind of lend into, you know, how you le lean a person, how you light a person. I mean, you know, I pretty much shoot on mostly black or gray, dark, pretty dark backgrounds for 90% yeah. of my pictures. There's a handful on white, but not many, and not much on color. But uh, I think, you know, for me, it's more about getting into the psyche of the person, getting into the person's head so that, Basically, the portrait has a connected feeling. I mean, that's the most important thing in a portrait is to be is to connect. If you look at a lot of the stuff today, I mean, people don't do photo shoots like they used to do anymore. You know, everybody has a, a selfie stick or take selfies, the celebrities. Mm -hmm. And the trend today on headshots is much more editorial than it was more like the classic portrait that I did during my 10 years of portrait photographer, so to speak. So much of what I see when it comes to instruction is about the lighting, right? Where someone is saying, oh, you put the umbrella or the softbox or the beauty dish here relative to the subject. But then I think that more attention is being spent on the lighting and less so about the subject, that the subject just ends up becoming a, a prop. And yes, the lighting is important. That's going to be an integral part of the look of the picture. But I think that at some point you got to flip it. You know, the lighting has to be sort of figured out and then you have to spend all your attention on the subject. And I think some people don't make that leap, which is why I see a lot of technically adept portraiture that just doesn't leave me feeling anything. And there's nobody um, home in the pictures, yeah. Right. You get these, especially when it's young women who are being photographed, they all give you like this sort of dead eye look, you know, like there's no, there's, there's nobody home. And, you know, the great portraiture, portraits I've seen, there's so much life in, in the eyes. And there's just something there. What, what allows you to do it? Is it just being able to recognize the moment when it gives, you know, happens? Or do you have to work in collaboration with that subject to build to that moment? Well, I try to spend as much time with the talent before I shoot them, uh, looking at the, which side of their face is better, which areas I want to play up in the highlights, play down in the shadows. So basically, I try to have all the lighting set before the talent comes in the room. Even if I'm doing three or four setups, I might have three or four different things set up. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell my assistants, I want the key on the right-hand side of the camera. I want a black fill on the left to kind of take the light down, give me a little bounce kick up under the eyes, no hair light, blah, blah, blah. And so then when the talent walks in, I basically got the framework of my shot set. And then I basically fine tune everything to their face. And I always begin my shoots in close because if I'm going to pull back, I'm going to always start in close to kind of break any distance between the subject and myself. And starting in with a headshot is the best way to get to know someone and to mm -hmm. start building a relationship. Once you pull that camera back, you lose that intimacy and that sense of honesty but at the same time, you've learned how to shoot the person so that by the time you pull the camera back, you know which angles to play up in the highlights, which angles to play down in the shadows, which side of the face to favor. And it makes it much easier. You have every range of personality uh, that you've photographed. Which one is 
more of a challenge? Is it the person who's walking in who has a big personality or is it the subject who is more quiet and tentative? Uh, you know, it can be, it can be both. That's a good question. It's funny. I've had big personalities come in. The big personality is kind of a facade for an actually more timid, quiet person because that's how they, that's their defense mechanism. And then you'll get some shy, timid people that are good listeners. So they become good subjects because they'll follow direction. So it can be a flip side of the coin. It doesn't have to be kind of like what you just said. Sometimes the big boisterous personalities are the ones that are more insecure in front of the camera and the more timid, shy people are more willing to uh, listen to what you have to say and open up in front of the lens. Yeah, because look, I imagine that sometimes you have to play psychologist. You oh, know, when someone walks into the room. I've taken the pictures I've taken, yeah. you got to be able to come, play up, come up or down to their level and make them realize you're playing for their team and share your vision with them to, to win their trust and confidence so that basically they will open up in front of the lens and follow your, your direction and thoughts. I'm sure we had had moments in your shoots when things aren't working for whatever reason, but you still have to exude confidence. Like everything is under control. That was sort of meant to happen. What did you find that worked for you to be able to be able to push through such moments and still be able to get the the result? Well, there'll be times, you know, like if I'm working with an art director where they have a specific uh, concept and uh, I know it's not going to work, uh, but you know, you have to humor them and you have to give them. You know, that's their vision. It's just like when you're teaching, you know, sometimes you have students that you realize they just don't have a clue, but you can't be discouraging. You've got to be encouraging and you've got to try to help them find their way, you, even though, you know, sometimes it's a dead end street. Same mm -hmm. with when I'm shooting. There's been times when I've been asked to photograph a talent and I know it's not going to work. But, you know, to just say, you know, this isn't going to work, blah, blah, blah. Then they're pissed off at you. You're not doing your job and they think you're a jerk. So you do the best you can, but at, at a certain point, you sometimes will reach a, a dead end street. It's not, you're not getting the picture. So your suggestion, my suggestion is, you know, can we try something else? Let me show you how I would approach this. I don't think we're really getting anywhere and we're, we're spinning wheels. And we try something, just an open, honest approach. I mean, I think that's what I built my career on pretty much. You know, sometimes things just aren't working and you have to move on to the next. So when you look at at the finished book and you hold it in your hands for the first time, what did you feel? Because you, you had this stuff on the computer, you know, but when you received that first box and you put it in your hand, what, what, what did you feel? Well, you know, it's funny. And then, and I don't mean this to sound egotistical. It was really bizarre. This is my 12th book, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, when I got that book for the first time, I'm like, shit, this thing is heavy. It reminded, <laughs> it reminded me. And it's heavier than it says on Amazon because I've had to ship a bunch of them to Europe, you know, some limited editions, which yeah. don't weigh really more than the regular one. And I think on Amazon it says the book is 7.1 pounds. Well, Jerry and I couldn't get any way around the fact that every time we weighed it with a light cardboard box, it was 9.6 pounds. So somewhere between 7 and 9.6 is what that book weighs. And so my thought when I first held it, besides the fact that shit, this is a heavy book, is that it reminded me of a museum catalog, which is kind of cool. Like, you know, when you go and see a yeah, big show. Uh -huh. I know like when I went to see uh, uh, the Brisson show, the Brisson Brisson show up in San Francisco at MoMA, uh, and I went down to buy the catalog, it's this big, heavy book. I thought, wow, this is kind of cool. It's kind of like you've arrived, because it, it is a big book, and it is a heavy book. I think that Tenoise did a great job with it, I, and especially considering I couldn't be on press. First time I've been on press for one of my books. So you can imagine how nervous I was. Oh, and they, yeah. don't, they don't do press proofs. They do, you know, one round of press proofs of a couple of sheets to show you what it's going to look like. And then they just do match proofs on an Epson printer. And they didn't even want my book of match proofs. For the most part, I think the printing's good. A few, few pictures are a little too magenta for my taste and color, but my... Friends of mine say no one would see that except for you, Greg, because you live with those pictures and they're like your family. I said, yeah, you're right. Bro. Is there one image in the book that you had to fight for to get it in there, with Greg? Because um, I know sometimes you can have a little struggle with someone who's designing the book and you guys are going back and forth. Oh, you know what? Uh, There's an interesting couple answers to this one. The first answer, which is a funny one, um, is that when I made the initial edit, there was about a thousand pictures. And I went over to meet with the publisher in Munich and uh, Hendrik Chinois, who since sadly passed away. But he uh, he said, well, let me see the pictures. I'll make an edit. And I thought, 
that's interesting. He doesn't know me. He doesn't really know Hollywood. You know, he knows who I am. He knows he wants to do a book with Greg Gorman, but that's about it, you know. And I said, okay. So I gave him a set of 1,000, 1,200 JPEGs. And the next day he came in and he says, well, I've gone through it. I've made a good edit. I think I've made a pretty good edit. I said, okay. You know, just listening, knowing fully well, mm -hmm. I was not going to follow any of this shit. And he said, uh, but you know, Greg, our market here at Tenoise is, uh, our market is pretty people. I said, really? I said, I never really uh, fancied myself as being a chronicler of necessarily just pretty people, Hendrick. And to, to his uh, credit, after that, he did select, and, and I agreed with him, the picture of Grace Jones for the cover, which I thought was Grace. Grace mm -hmm. is so stuck. She's so happy. She finally just got the book. We FaceTimed the other night in Jamaica, and, and she got the book, and she was so happy. Just cool. And, uh, and she's someone I shot for so many years, you know, but the picture was more of a graphic. So he came up with that. Uh, which was kind of fun, but I didn't fight with Gary because uh, Gary and I know each other really well, and uh, I think you can't have an art director that you don't know really well. And Gary's known me for forty some years, so and we have really similar tastes. So I pretty much let it, it be with him. And if I felt strongly about a portrait, I'd fight for it, you know. And then I'd usually win. But if he had a good argument. Um, I would lose, and I would. I was didn't have the, the such an ego that I couldn't let go of a picture. Mm -hmm. It was a tough situation because there were a lot of pictures I wanted in the book, a lot of friends I wanted in the book. But in the ninth hour, we decided pretty much with a handful of few friends I did let slide by, but pretty much went for heavy hitters. Well, it's a great book. And uh, but my last question, which I ask each guest, is I ask them to recommend another photographer, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who are the photographer being and why? I would say uh, it really would be Helmut Newton because Helmut is somebody, unless you want a younger photographer, but Helmut was someone whose work I admired. I remember going to see his first show at the Nicholas Wilder Gallery back in the early 70s called White Women. I was just so moved by his imagery and obviously our styles couldn't be more different, but we went on to become friends and I'm still friends with his, his wife, June. And, uh, in so many ways, he really, uh, inspired me. I was a huge fan of heroes. I mean, I love hero. I love Guy Bernard. I mean, there's so many photographers for so many different reasons. Obviously, uh, Avedon and Penn were huge influences. George, George Harrell, who I photographed, we photographed each other was a, a big influence, especially for more environmental, portraits and very dramatic lighting. He he would drag a four by five round on a set of sticks like you and I would move around with a 35. I mean, it's amazing to watch wow. George. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for another great book, man. Well, thank you so much. And let's get together. You know, I, I need another date with the, uh, with the wife. <laughs> <laughs> I felt estranged with her so far at the other end of the table, but we had a definite connection, which was great. Thanks to Greg for joining us. Find out more about Greg and his work by visiting GormanPhotography.com. And if you purchase his book, It's Not About Me, please consider using the Amazon affiliate link in our show notes or website to support the show. If you're a devoted listener and subscribe to the podcast, write us a review on whatever service you listen to podcasts. Those reviews have allowed us to grow. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and our mailing list, on the YouTube channel, I offer critiques on images submitted by TCF listeners like you, while the mailing list keeps you updated with all TCF events, including workshops and more. Sign up today. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or make a one-time or reoccurring donation via PayPal. Thanks to Greg Glatz and Grant Matthews for their recent contributions. We also provide a series of ebooks on photography available for purchase on our website, it's my way of sharing my experience and knowledge and another way for you to support the show. And if you can't find every episode of the show, download the Candid Frame app, which is available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at Incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.